culture, and also a bit about um, why bamboo, right? Why do we choose bamboo? And little snippets on engineered bamboo as well. Um, so I'm going to launch off now um, and start sharing my screen and start the talk, yeah? Okay, everyone good with the screen? Um, can you give me a thumbs up if it's okay? Yeah, all good, yeah. So really this talk is a, a talk that I do present quite a lot throughout the years. Um, it's, it's been modified as we go along and this is specially modified for you guys uh, uh, in Texas and everywhere else. So it is interesting that I find that there are a few species of bamboo in Texas, um, three native species, but imagine the rest of the world in purple, right? This is where bamboo thrives. This is where it grows fast, it grows strong, and it is prevalent everywhere. Um, and actually Texas is within that zone, which surprised me. Um, and I found out through Jen and the staff that uh, you are actually harvesting bamboo and using it. Wow, that is, uh, that is so good. Because um, my zone of work is a lot more in Southeast Asia, more of this part of the world, uh, a bit of India and more in Australia now, slowly. But you guys are here where a lot is happening and also down south a lot more in Colombia, in Brazil, and parts of Africa as well. So to set the scene, um, there are about 440 species lower down south from you guys in South America. And then globally, bamboo has got 1,500 species or more of bamboo. There's a, there's a lot of bamboo. We all need to know that bamboo, um, when you, when you mention bamboo, this is a pole or a calm. And together, they form a clump or a group. Okay? So bamboo clumps or runs. Sympodial bamboo means bamboo that grows in a group. It groups up. Yeah? And running bamboo is monopodial bamboo. Um, so running bamboo has caused in the past a lot of neighborhood wars, right? Even uh, people shooting at each other because the bamboo uh, becomes a pest, right? It sort of runs across your, under your fence and out into your neighbors, sort of even through the concrete pavement and, and cause a problem, right? Cracks and everything. So running bamboo can cause a problem if it's not controlled and clumping bamboo keeps, keeps together in groups. Bamboo grows very fast, right? Sometimes up to a meter a day it can grow. Um, and size-wise, it can be as small as 30 cm or one foot as a bamboo grass, right? Bamboo is a grass. Or it can, be, can grow up to 100, uh, 30 meters, which is 100 feet. And that's quite tall for some species. Um, here you can see the difference between a shoot, a younger, younger shoot shooting up and then a more mature bamboo calm. Um, what you need to know is that uh, the parts you see above the ground are the, that's the internode and the node. This is the node itself, the node. Um, and then just, within the node inside is what you call a diaphragm. So bamboo, we'll go through a bit more about the anatomy and this at the bottom, the root is called the rhizome. So I'm going to go through uh, almost like a tour of bamboo, the types of bamboo, right? Uh, prominent types of bamboo used mainly for furniture and construction around the world. What you get in 
mainly in South America, in Colombia, is Guadua, right? Guadua augustiflora. These are bamboo that grow very straight, very regular, and is really one of the best bamboo for construction, right? It is a giant bamboo, if you like. Um, it can grow up to sort of this wide and very, very uniform and straight. Um, you, you can find out a bit more about Guadua, Google it, and there's a lot of information. Uh, there's a website called guadua.com, which is very, very useful. Um, in China, you have Moso, uh, Philostasi edulis. This is running bamboo. Guadua is more of clumping bamboo. So this bamboo runs. Um, again, pretty regular um, in diameter and also length, very straight. Um, good for construction and for furniture as well. In Indonesia, there are many species of bamboo, almost 70 species, and this is one of them. Uh, we call it petong or dendrocalamus asper, um, a form of giant bamboo as well. Uh, I use it a lot. I use it um, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and other parts of Asia to construct as the main structural member for columns, for beams, and its other species, tali or gigantic claw apis, is a thinner type of bamboo, which we use for rafters and for balustrading bits and pieces. So you can see different variants and types of bamboo. Yeah? Um, a friend of mine who works in the Orang Halputan Haven in Medan put this together. This is 14 species of bamboo just within his locality. Uh, very interesting to see the variation from this thin bamboo, uh, probably used as a fishing rod to the thicker ones that are more for construction. The different textures, right? Uh, notice how the internodes uh, vary in size and also in shape, right? You get different types of shapes as well. Um, thicknesses within the bamboo wall itself vary as well, right? Certain bamboo have very thick walls, up to 2 cm, sometimes 3 at the base, 4. Um, others are only like a few millimeters. So it is a big range, a wide range of how bamboo comes to us. In Malaysia, again, different species of bamboo, right? You get this yellow, yellow variant as well. Um, many, many types. I've been doing some work in the Philippines as well. And you have uh, Kawayan Tinik, which is Bambusa blumiana. Um, very much an uneven bamboo, right? It tapers, it twists and turns. Very hard to get straight ones. If you notice the difference between the earlier Guadua, this one moves all over the place. So if you're constructing, you need to be aware of this and, and know how to deal with it. Um, in Indonesia, we call this duri, duri which is a thorn. Uh, you can see here, there's a lot of thorns within this clumping bamboo that you need to, to cut off uh, before you can use it. In Thailand, um, also doing some work there, the bamboos there, as you go up north, become thinner, right? Thinner, but the walls are thicker. Um, there are different types of species again. Um, in Vietnam, you can see now even more, the bamboo is smaller, right? Smaller and the actual gap inside is also smaller sometimes even nearly solid, right? Only a small gap. So to use these for construction, you really need to be able to sister them, three or four of these together to get enough strength to be able to construct with these. Uh, they're good for furniture. A friend of mine, James Wolf, uses them for bikes, bicycles, right? He does racing bikes uh, in, in the States. He's got a company that does that. Um, while also producing other stuff in his uh, bamboo factory. You can look him up, James Wolf or uh, Bamboo Master in Vietnam. 
So yeah, um, I think really to share that uh, there are many bamboo species in general. They vary in terms of everything, right? Length, thickness, usability. Um, so it is about learning which species is suitable for what kind of work. Like, let's take, for example, grapes, right? If you say grapes, grapes can grow everywhere, even in the tropics, in the highlands of the tropics. But when you taste a particular grape uh, in different regions, the grape is different, right? Sometimes it's not too sweet or it's very much sour. Same as bamboo. Um, uh, Dendrocalamus esper grows in many, many countries, but it is in Indonesia and Malaysia and maybe Thailand as well, where it really thrives and grows to its optimum. Um, when you use bamboo, like Dendrocalamus asper in certain countries that are not that um, successful for it to grow, you need to test it first for its strength to see if it's workable, right? So that's something we need to be aware of. I'm going to move now onto my journey in bamboo. Right? I always like to show this uh, photograph because it, it sort of summarizes my journey um, from conventional architecture, right? I practiced for nearly 30 years in conventional work before six years ago, uh, landing in Bali, accepting a job with Ibuku in Bali. Uh, for those of you who know, Ibuku, um, they are a prime bamboo design and construct company. Uh, been around for about eight years now, doing very, very good work. Um, I joined them six years ago from Melbourne, uh, going up to Bali, dressed in my long pants, uh, socks, and nice leather shoes going there into the tropics, right? And morphing midway to a bit more or less sort of uh, wearing shorts now, no, no socks and uh, some sandals, covered sandals. And then eventually within the five years going to just uh, slippers and, and, and really walking on the grass, right? It almost summarizes uh, life in Bali where things sort of get reduced to the, the minimum, um, the bare minimums, right? The bare essentials. So that was sort of, that summarizes my journey. Um, this is what I used to do. Uh, many moons ago, right? working in business parks in England, um, a lot of master planning uh, in Malaysia, in England as well, um, and in Australia. Uh, much hospitality in Malaysia, doing hotels, um, bigger developments, uh, working in, a, in a, the Middle East as well. Um, some Australian schemes and some, some high rise. So my work was mainly very much more as a conventional architect before going to Bali. But the shift happened uh, after I joined Ibuku, uh, straight into bamboo, right? Full 100% bamboo all the way. And this slide almost summarizes how I landed in Bali, right? an office without windows. Um, if you Google the Ibuku office, you'll see it, the Ibuku studio. No windows, uh, very interesting structure, no cars, uh, bu uh, buffaloes in the car park, if you like, um, very open structure. And I work in the environment of the green school. Um, if you Google green school, Bali is a very interesting uh, education concept, and uh, if you like. And many buildings that we built in Green Village, right? This is how bamboo, how luxurious bamboo can become. If you look up Green Village, uh, Bali. And this is the office, the Ibuku office, where, yeah, we really work in the open uh, and barefoot as well. Uh, just coincidentally, Sharma Springs. Sharma Springs um, is a six and a half level bamboo building, right? Cost about 200, 2 million US dollars to build. This is one of the prime bamboo buildings in the world. Um, it is a residence for an American IT um, person, family.
family if you like uh, and he doesn't he only he only comes here like once a year and the rest of the time is rented out uh, for people who who want to come for a holiday uh, it's got many many rooms and many many facilities an interesting building which you know you guys get a chance yeah come to green village and and rent a, a place to experience it experience your your bamboo journey right some of the buildings uh, that I was involved in uh, while at Ibuku, um, some famous people uh, have uh, or are still staying there. Um, in Ibuku itself, um, we took the locals, the Balinese locals, to overseas projects. Right, this is in uh, in Africa. To build a restaurant and this one is in the Maldives taking what the Balinese have built together with Ibuku shipping our bamboo because these places did not have bamboo we shipped bamboo from Indonesia and took a team across to build right this, this is quite an interesting uh, journey to build these structures away from Indonesia um, these two are a restaurant and this one is a, a, like a pool bar or beachside uh, pavilion in the Maldives. Um, this one is a like a badminton hall, if you like, badminton roof. And this is a school. So I left Ibuku after four years, uh, great experience and, and started on my own. Um, the first building I built was again with some Balinese people on an exhibition exhibition building, if you like, to promote bamboo in Malaysia. Um, interestingly, built in five days, right? Only five days while still giving talks every day. But these guys, we ordered bamboo specifically from Malaysia, local bamboo, and pre-designed and pre-built this with contractors the foundations and the footings, and then came with the team and built this in five days. Uh, quite, a, quite an experience for everyone. Um, it was a festival with many people attending as well. This is actually my house, um, Leng and my house. We, we built this in Bali, halfway through Ibuku, and then after leaving, continued to finish it. So this is the main house. It's a one bedroom house with a bedroom above, and a living area below, and we added a pool later, little plunge pool for two, um, a tree house in front of it as well, right? all out of bamboo. It is very interesting to not only just design and get your buildings constructed for others, for clients, but when you build your own house and when you live in it, uh, especially if it's bamboo, it's a totally different experience and you learn a lot from it as well. Uh, once I started on my own, I began to get projects. Uh, this is in Fiji, uh, a marina for big yachts. You can see these super yachts that come in, but we were asked to design uh, the clubhouse and all the facilities around this little hill uh, in Fiji itself. And this is the marina. Our work was mainly some of the master planning as well and concentrating here at the marina. I'll show you some of the restaurant later when we talk about structural engineering. I'll show that to you, this, this couple of buildings later. Um, this is something in the Philippines that we are prototyping for, for a resort. Um, it's like a Nautilus shell type structure. And this is in the Philippines, a gathering space for about 200 people. A prototype as well. Recently, we finished our concept design for a restaurant uh, for the Orang Hutan Haven in Medan in Indonesia, uh, based on more of a, the corona of a flower, uh, petals and leaves, natural shapes. Um, and this project is now uh, in design development stage. Working also with architects from different parts of the world. I was in Melbourne, uh, 
uh, I have an architect in Bali and another architect um, in South America to work together on this project. Our latest project is a bridge. This is in uh, Malaysia. It is uh, 30 meters wide, it spans 30 meters, uh, connecting two villages across a river. And this is just in its concept stage, just to share with you guys. I also teach, uh, I've been teaching for about six years now uh, through Bamboo U. Bamboo U again is a, another outfit, uh, part of Ibuku as well, run by Orin. Uh, been facilitating there for now six years, uh, continue to do so on and off. Um, very interesting and you meet all kinds of people from all over the world. Uh, recently, I've been teaching away from Bamboo U, going to universities in Singapore, and also to places like yourselves to, to again, spread the word of bamboo. These are more younger first, second year students in architecture school. And actually during, during COVID, uh, I started an Instagram account, two Instagram accounts, uh, started two websites and also began a course an online designing bamboo buildings course. Um, the first one is running now. Uh, I can talk a bit more about that later. And the second one is due on a, to start on the 14th of April, mainly for architects and designers, right? Who are interested to design in, in bamboo. So this is almost halfway to the talk, right? Uh, I wanted to show you this uh, out of interest. Uh, if you Google seven stages in the, in a bamboo grove, right? This is way, way back in China, uh, where during parliament, right? These guys are administrators uh, during the boring sessions of parliament. These seven guys escape, escape from parliament usually, uh, and then hid in this bamboo grove, right? somehow became legend. They, they just, they were probably the first hippies, right? Playing music, reciting poetry, uh, spending their time in a bamboo grove. Right? Um, and you find many, many versions of paintings of this, right? Uh, also out of interest for me is really uh, how the bamboo is depicted, right? Not just the story itself. Uh, it's a particular feeling when you get into a bamboo grove as well. Uh, that is nice. You feel, you feel the clean air. Uh, and sometimes when the breeze moves around, you also feel the sound of the rustling of the leaves, right? Um, so yeah. This is uh, a mid break from the talk. Everyone going okay? Yeah, all good? Give me a thumbs up if you are okay. Right, um, gonna continue now. So why, why do we wanna use bamboo? Um, out of all the things that are, all the materials that are around the world, why do we wanna use bamboo? Uh, let me go through, right? You can see that Bamboo has the potential and it can substitute in many circumstances, timber, steel, and even concrete, if you know how. Um, not just in small scale, but also in a middle scale, right? And larger. Who's to say we cannot build skyscrapers from bamboo right? eventually, right? We may. Bamboo sequesters a lot more carbon than other building materials and outputs more oxygen as well, kilogram for kilogram, compared to other materials. It is interesting that, yeah, it holds more carbon and outputs more oxygen. This one I like a lot because Bamboo, through my travels, I've seen it firsthand, how it creates jobs, not just in the building industry, but all the way upstream, all the way downstream, right? From the harvesting of the bamboo, transporting it to the factory, preparing it, right? Treating it, and then the construction side as well. It's a whole industry um, that is created and it lifts up the poorer regions where bamboo grow. 
bamboo so happened to grow in a lot of the less uh, fortunate areas. Bamboo restores land, uh, degraded land, um, and also reduces erosion. Uh, it, its roots really go down and hold the soil um, and, and also prevents uh, runoff, right? It is lightweight, right? It's lightweight when you think about a steel beam. Uh, you cannot do that with a steel beam. Yeah, two persons or one person running it. And it is very economical way to construct. When you compare it to today's uh, high-tech ways uh, and mechanized ways of construction. Within the purple zones, even in Texas, it is readily available. Um, and if you can succeed in growing good quality bamboo, suitable for construction or for other purposes, then yeah, you're onto a good thing. Yeah, one meter a day, it grows really fast and quick. Um, within a few weeks, bamboo actually grows to its full length, it shoots up all the way up, sometimes up to 15, 20 meters very quickly within a few weeks. And then it starts uh, building up muscle, starts growing out, spreading and, and building up muscle and, and strength as it grows. It matures in, when we say mature, it means it's ready for harvesting in about three to five years. That's when it's ready to be harvested. There's a lot of signs already within uh, how bamboo grows and how to manage all this, but it's not part of this, this talk. Uh, again, you can find out a lot online of how to manage, cultivate and manage bamboo before harvesting. And of course, many, many uses like the coconut tree. Bamboo has even more uses than the coconut tree, right? The coconut tree, we say have 101 uses, but bamboo has got a lot, lot more than that. Of course, it is tasty, right? Uh, bamboo shoots, if you, if you have tried bamboo shoots, sort of you who have traveled to Malaysia, Thailand, and you have tried green curry bamboo shoots with chicken or even on, on its own, wow, it is really tasty, right? Yum. Um, there are many industries now starting up with people not just growing high value bamboo, but also growing uh, bamboo for its shoots, right? Uh, for food security um, and they harvest the shoots, they bottle it or, or they sell it fresh. Uh, in Vietnam, in Thailand, you can get fresh bamboo shoots that are crunchy, sweet, or it's prepared in a salad as well. I show you this picture because bamboo has been labeled uh, a poor man's timber in many Asian countries and South American countries uh, because it's got this past of it rotting very easily, right? It rots within a couple of years. This is what happens to a bamboo building. If you don't design it correctly and detail it correctly, or even from the start, right? If you don't harvest, if you don't treat, and if you don't put it together properly with the right design, this is what happens. And bamboo gets its bad name in the past. Um, this is now changing as people get more aware of uh, how to then harvest, to treat, and to design bamboo in the right way. Because uh, if you do it right, it will last a lifetime. It will last 50 years. Uh, this is the number that uh, a lot more contemporary advocates of bamboo are talking about a lifetime. Uh, this is in Bali, a bamboo and timber shack in a paddy field, right? In a rice field uh, that lasts for a couple of years. And uh, every year the farmer has to change these because it's getting sunned and rained on um, and it's to upgrade his roof. This is a constant trouble for this guy. But when you look on the right, 
This is a newly designed hut in the paddy field we did in Bamboo U as part of a, a course or a workshop. Uh, and this is going to last a long time because the bamboo is elevated off the ground, right? Um, this is uh, PVC tubes with concrete infill and it's setting up above without any de uh, rising damp. The floors are raised, it's a neat bridge. There are wide overhangs, all the water is thrown off, the sun doesn't hit the bamboo and it's going to last a lot, lot longer than this guy, right? And you don't need to maintain it uh, all the time. Perhaps the sacrificial grass roof needs to be changed now and then, but that's the way it's looking, right? When you compare the two. This I've put in uh, at 92 stories of the Empire State Building, right? Uh, just to give you this comparison of how steel has developed, the steel industry in those days, this is what, 100 years ago, maybe more, um, how developed this is compared to bamboo today. Eh? Bamboo today is just starting off four or five stories is a big deal. So how far has steel and concrete moved ahead, whereas bamboo has been left behind, but it is, it is almost regenerating as a material that was shunned, poor man's timber. And now, wow, you know, we have to look back and see what bamboo can do. Um, if we do it right, it may be possible to do a lot more things, a lot more things. And because it's regenerative, because it's um, also sequesters, carbon, pumps up oxygen, and many things that uh, make it more sustainable to use bamboo when you think about digging iron ore out from the ground or trying to get cement, more cement to be made to build buildings. So really, uh, when you compare the tallest timber building nowadays, timber CLT is really popular, right? Uh, 20 stories, 30 stories, now we're talking about timber buildings. Uh, the Eiffel Tower in steel, and then this humble bamboo shack right? as a comparison is still way behind and it, it's trying to now grow as an industry. Um, I'm going to now talk a bit more about um, engineered bamboo. Okay, A lot of the work you've seen so far is natural calm bamboo. Whereas engineered bamboo uh, means breaking down the bamboo into smaller parts and then recombining it uh, to make uh, products. So what are the ways, right? We go three ways, right? You can split the bamboo, which is one. You can cross cut it, which is two. Or linear cut it, which is three. It's two as well. Or you can flatten it, right? That is three. From all these, you can then also start producing products like beams where you can bind them, right? Or you can weave them into mats or you can connect them and prefabricate them into beams, um, curved beams, um, straight beams. So all these are possible and, and there's a lot of engineering methods that can be developed for bamboo, right? This is only the beginning. So with engineered bamboo, what we are talking about is using heat, glue, compressing the bamboo, and then creating products out of it. Right? It is still not as structurally strong as, say, glue lamp, right, or, or laminated timber, but it is growing as an industry. The two main types would be strips, where bamboo is actually broken down into strips or into chips. Right? And with strips, you get laminated timber, strand woven timber, or composites. Right? Just going through this quite fast. I hope you, you guys are following. So take, for example, from a raw bamboo pole, right? It goes into strips. 
it's formed into strips. So you get a strip or a lath of bamboo, and then these are laminated horizontally or vertically, or they are sort of crisscross to make it stronger, yeah? A mixture of laminated, uh, horizontal and vertical laminations. And this is beginning to grow, uh, laminated bamboo. And finger jointing as well has started, um, same like timber, and you get a lot more of a stronger product. So strand woven really is about uh, pressurizing the, the bamboo strands and then trying to glue it, right? glue it together to form boards. Um, a lot of failure in the early days, but now I think the, the, the actual boards are becoming more stable. Bamboo is now even, strand woven bamboo is now even used for outdoor decks, right? Um, and these last a long time and the market is now really growing for these. And you can imagine the applications now of what we can do, right? even for cladding eventually, um, a lot of options. Some pictures of how the, the fibers are crushed. We will talk a lot more about bamboo as a material uh, in I think three, four days time in the next the part two of the, of the workshop. Um, please join us for that of how I'll talk a bit more about the anatomy of bamboo and the fibers and vascular bundles as well. Zephyr is where the long fibers are, are, are brushed and then combined right, to make very strong boards. Again, this is a very new field that is just developing in, uh, in the aerospace and automotive industry, in the marine industry, uh, a new world being opened up. Um, this is a question a lot of people ask about getting bamboo approved, right? Or compliant with local um, regulations. It is easier in Southeast Asian and South American countries to get bamboo approved uh, because it's not as highly regulated in these areas. Um, in America, where you guys are, it is a tough process, a tough process. I'll mention that a bit later. Let me just go through that first. This, one of my experiences when at Ibukura, trying to get this guy approved. This is Area 15 in Las Vegas. It is like a theme park for geeks, if you like. We were asked, commissioned to do this a little, almost like an installation, bamboo installation, um, in, in this new building. And just to get this through, took us almost a year plus um, to get this approved by, by the authorities. Not easy. Um, Another experience I had was trying to do a landscape feature, a bamboo landscape feature in one of the prominent areas of New York where there were a lot of apartments with a developer. And again, in the end that couldn't get through, couldn't get through because of the compliance, the high level of compliance needed. So that may be a bit of a barrier in certain areas, but uh, from my experience working in Asia and, and in South America with others, is that you really have to take it stage by stage. Um, you almost have to bring the approving authorities to show them what has happened elsewhere and then work backwards with your engineers, with specialist engineers to prove that it can work to the compliance that has been set. This is tougher in uh, cyclonic areas. Uh, in earthquake areas, seismic areas, um, but all that is possible through engineers now specializing in bamboo. Right? There are many engineers now that specialize around the world in bamboo. And these are the people that can work with designers together to be able to then convince the authorities. It is still not an easy process, but it is possible. 
So a bit about engineering process as well. Um, I mentioned earlier the two buildings in Fiji. There's actually four of these, but I'm just showing you these two where we have designed them and modeled them as well on 3D. And then we work with our engineers. In this case, this is uh, an outfit in Bali uh, with actually French trained engineers that take our modeling and then do their calculations, eventually coming up with sizing as well for the bamboo. Um, we had to beef up some areas because this in Fiji itself is a Cat 5, right? Category 5 cyclonic. So these areas here were weak points, as you can see here. Um, they, they went through testing and we felt this had to be beefed up. All these areas had to be beefed up because they were almost like a net or a scoop that could, because of the winds coming this way, this could actually blow off and we had to tighten all these up as well. You can design a building nowadays, put it through to an engineer and work with him to calculate uh, whether your bamboo sizing and numbers are adequate enough for the zone you're designing in. So again, another building, uh, structural analysis um, happening there, as you can see. So it's developed in a certain way that, that uh, we can continue to design with confidence and build it with confidence. How do we combine bamboo with other materials? Uh, I was asked to talk a bit about this. So one slide to show it. Um, some experience of using uh, grass roofs on top of bamboo buildings. Uh, this is actually a brick panel building, but bamboo structure. Um, again, fully bamboo structured roof uh, onto which uh, we built a grass roof quite interesting because the buildings uh, have very stabilized temperature underneath. Grass roofs, done a lot in Bali. Local grass uh, that's been dried and then layered. Copper, copper tiles, recycled car windscreens, plastic sheets, very basic for nursery buildings metal sheets, and then canvas, obviously, from, from the poor man's canvas or recycled canvas to umbrella to very high uh, priced fabrics. So that is all possible. Again, one slide doesn't do it justice because there's a lot more about how to combine other materials with bamboo. Again, some further reading. Uh, if you want to look for books uh, and publications of bamboo, just visit our website, um, our blog. We have, we have got some information there. There's about nearly 30 articles there for you to read. Um, but these two books are quite good if you are uh, moving into bamboo, Booming Bamboo, a new book. Uh, and Designing and Building with Bamboo is an old book, but a new edition is coming out. So wait for that. And here we are. Um, I'm just going to direct you uh, towards the end of this talk now to the two Instagram accounts that I hold. Um, the blog, which is at betterbamboobuildings.com and then our practice website as well. Um, I think that is it for now. I'm going to stop sharing or... Actually, I won't stop sharing because I might have to go back. Uh, I'll, I'll now hand it back to Jen. Okay. Thank you. Um, and fantastic. Thank you very much, Eugene, for that presentation. Um, if y'all don't mind just joining me and thanking you, Jen, again. Um, and Thank at this you. point, we want to, um, to open it up to questions. I'm sure that uh, some things have come up during the course of the presentation. You might have also come in with questions. Um, that might not have been covered. So feel free to um, drop those in the chat or if you, I encourage you to, you know, just to increase interaction to just go ahead and raise your hand and um, jump in. Uh, feel free to ask a question.
Okay, well, while well, y'all are thinking, I had a couple during um, during the talk. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned was just in the process of uh, building your own bamboo house. You said that was a really eye-opening experience. Do you mind sharing um, more about what you learned through that very personal journey? I think firstly, as an architect, um, if you haven't constructed your own building and you have only just designed it and then someone else has constructed it for you, um, constructing it yourself with others as a process will open up new avenues of perception, right? In how a building is built. Um, you will learn a lot more by constructing rather than learning from theory. Um, in relation to a bamboo building, building it and also living in it, uh, you learn a lot more, especially the bamboo buildings that I built are more open-sided buildings. They are not rooms, there are rooms that are closed in, right? Uh, because you're living in the tropics in Bali, you need, for me, uh, my buildings, are tropically designed right, to, to interact with the climate. In other words, using encouraging cross ventilation, right, keeping out the sun, using passive design, in other words, um, to then create a cooling effect. In the tropics, to gain comfort, you need to have evaporation. You need to evaporate your moisture off your skin to create thermal comfort. Is the basis of living in the tropics. The shortcut is to have an air-conditioned room or a fan. Um, but if you don't want to expend energy, you design it naturally and passively through steep roofs, large overhangs, using ventilation and how air movement is, how hot air rises, encouraging airflow up and then drawing air through the buildings. So when air movement crosses our skin, it cools us, right? It evaporates our perspiration and cools us and we feel comfortable. That is how it is in the tropics right? compared to temperate zones. When you do that, then you experience the building. If you have windows, which this house of mine doesn't have, I'm gonna go back to it now. So there's no windows. We just draw the curtains and go to sleep at night. So you actually experience um, nature, right? You're not into this artificial bubble when you go to bed. Constructing with bamboo also helps you to realize that the joints that you draw, the joints that you detail um, may not always work. And you need to then be flexible on site uh, to be able to, to be nimble and change as you go, right? Uh, certain joints I've had to change. Um, the staging of things may be different again, right? From how you perceive it uh, when you're designing it. I hope that sort of answers uh, some of the questions that were asked. Yeah, I think that gives us a good start. Um... There's also a couple of questions that I'm seeing here in the chat from Susan and Kathy, uh, both a little bit related on the treatment of bamboo. Uh, I know that we're going to get into that a little bit in part two on Thursday, but um, Kathy specifically has uh, a question on how bamboo reacts to extremes of, of cold and hot, wet and dry, um, and how, how treatment might address that. Okay. Um... Treatment of bamboo mainly helps to prevent it from being eaten by insects and bugs, right? That's the main type of treatment. And the other type of treatment is that it makes it last a bit longer in terms of last, uh, not rotting that quickly, right? If it's exposed to water, constant damp and constant sunlight, strong sunlight, it can then deteriorate. That treatment helps a bit more. But if we are saying that bamboo 
is being shipped or if you are growing bamboo in extremes of temperature, for example, um, we ship bamboo from Indonesia to Dubai. Any kind of treatment that you do will not help the bamboo with this shift of, of temperature, right? From say 30 degrees to about sometimes 50 degrees in a day. With this shift in moisture as well, bamboo um, is like a sponge, right? Even if it's dried out and all stabilized, it can still keep absorbing moisture and letting it go. So sealing bamboo helps to prevent it, helps to stabilize it. Even then, in the harshness of the Dubai climate, a lot of our bamboo that we ship there cracked, right? Due to the dryness of it all, it is almost, what, 20% instead of 80% uh, in the tropics. In the desert, it's like 20% humidity, maybe 30 we even drilled holes in our bamboo to stabilize, try and stabilize the temperature. And some bamboo we even saw cut to make it more stable. But a lot of the bamboo cracked, unfortunately. So it is really natural to say that if you're forcing a material that's coming in from a hot and humid zone into a dry desert or a, or a sort of cold climate, temperature, that can create issues. Saying that, if you think about car parks in Europe, there are two or three car parks that use bamboo, Guadua bamboo, right, from South America, as screening. Look them up and you'll see a right, bamboo car park screens. Um, these bamboo are still there. Right? They, they haven't, they seem to have stabilized them and, and they are still being used as cladding. They haven't cracked. So again, we need to know. Great. Um, and it looks like we might have time for just one more question. Um, there's one in the chat from Ray. Um, OK, one more just popped up. So we'll try to squeeze in both of those. Uh, Ray, do you want to um, to share your question directly with you, Jen? Yeah. Uh, so like I've like read articles before about like bamboo high rises and like, kind of touched on it with the like, wooden ones too. So I guess like it's been mostly conceptual design, like they haven't really built a lot of them yet. Um so it's kind of like wondering like what do you think are like, the main obstacles preventing us from building so, like bamboo high rises and how can we overcome them? I didn't get all of it. Um maybe Jen, if you can if you have got that, can you just uh conveyed it to me? Yeah, so it cut off just right at the end, but um, reading the question, it says, you know, the, you know, basically what are the main obstacles to preventing us from building those, those really high towers um, and going beyond the concept into, into practice? Yeah, uh, a lot of it is really getting past the approvers, right? The people that approve it. Um, when you start comparing uh, steelwork and timber that can go high rise, um, there still needs a lot of study of how we can apply um, fire resistant applications onto bamboo, right? Um, to protect it, to be able to achieve its fire integrity uh, comparable to steel, concrete, and timber before we can go high rise. We can build a skyscraper out of bamboo without any issue, right? Structurally, it's fine. It can stand up, uh, it can perform all the functions, it won't sway, it won't tilt. The only main issues would be fire. Fire. Um, of course, bamboo may have to be a bit more bulky than, than say steel, right? To, to have its, the same performance, uh, but it is possible. The main issues I see for a bamboo skyscraper, if you look up bamboo skyscraper, again, there's, there's a lot that's been done as well to design it, um, it is actually fire. And the other issue is uh, engineering the services in, right? Uh, how do you make a lift if it's not in bamboo? Um, it probably has to be a reinforced concrete lift core 
um, certain parts of the building will have to be non-bamboo and it is deciding on how much you want to compromise right the cores may may have to be in in concrete or steel combination uh, to get the lifts to work right but mid-rise seven eight stories i think is possible right, to do with a minimum of other materials provided you can get it approved uh, fire wise right or one day someone might come with a intumescent spray that can still preserve the look of bamboo, almost like a clear coat intumescent spray that can um, protect the bamboo uh, in terms of flammability and, and fire integrity. Yeah? Uh, I'm looking forward to the day that arrives. Fantastic. And um, Eugene, if you have uh, just time for one more question, it's, it is six o'clock right now, um, but Charlie had uh, one in the chat if you want to share that. Please. If that works, okay. Sure. Yeah, thank you, this is, this is wonderful. Um, I don't know uh, much at all about bamboo forestry and I was wondering just uh, if it's raising in popularity, um, what uh, kinds of considerations do you have for like responsibly sourcing bamboo? Uh, is that a concern different from like timber products? Again, this is a field that is developing very, very quickly, uh, especially in bamboo growing areas or that haven't got bamboo, right? Uh, many countries are trying to get grants, poorer countries, to grow bamboo in a big, big way. Right? Mm -hmm. Places like Malawi in Africa, um, even Malaysia, people are starting bamboo plantations, um, huge ones, uh, because it only takes five years and it has become very much a business option for many uh, and some of the people who are more environmentally conscious want to start these plantations for the future um, the techniques and all that are very different from uh, timber plantations Charlie yeah there are uh, publications already beginning to develop within the bamboo world um, if you look up um, this publication by Arif, A-R-I-E-F, Arif Rabik, R-A-B-I-K. Uh, he talks about sustainable bamboo growing, harvesting, and also treatment. Um, many, many of the books that I listed also have them in different forms of how to grow bamboo, how to harvest it responsibly, right, within a, a, a clump. There are many generations of bamboo. Right? Uh, I've been through uh, some of the courses with Ari. It's a great granddad bamboo, grandma bamboo, auntie bamboo, and baby bamboo. Right? They all thrive in this clump. And you have to be careful how you manage your clump and what you harvest so that the clump uh, thrives. Like a rose bush, right? How, how do you then manage? Uh, mm -hmm. There are techniques that are already established of how to cut, where to cut, how low to cut, right? How to clear your clump. It, bamboo also moves through uh, the life cycle, moves through the rainy season as well, right? After each rainy season, it shoots, right? The new, the new generation comes up and you can see clearly when you look at the clump, the greener ones and the more fresh face, uh, smooth face ones are the young ones coming up, right? All this young um, youth bamboo. <laughs> the older ones, the great granddads will have all the freckles and the, all the fungus growing on it, right? Really seasoned ones that have been like five years, seven years old. After seven years, bamboo is no more useful, right? It becomes, it loses its uh, strength for construction, right? You can use it for other things, but you cannot use it for construction anymore because it's sort of like, as we get old as well, right? Our body, our muscles are not as strong, very similar. So I hope that helps you uh, as you try to get more information, yeah? Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll look that guy up. Uh, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Eugen. Uh, that brings us to the end of the session. Um, one, one more final thank you for Eugen. Um, 
we will, we're thrilled again to have him uh, join us uh, for the session two, which takes place on Thursday from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, so Eugene will just do a really quick introduction, um, diving more into the material that is bamboo. Um, and then we'll have uh, two of our Materials Lab TAs lead the, the workshop session. I want to just give a chance for them to give a quick hello so that we can uh, see what's coming yeah. up. Yeah. Hi, all. Uh, I'm Dan. Uh, I'll, I'll be leading the workshop with Brandon um, and we'll be kind of we'll be making a plant stand and kind of looking at some of these um, the different knots and joinery involved. Uh, we'll be going through that and so you can develop some skills that way. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm really excited to see uh, some of you on Thursday. It should be really fun. Okay. Um, well, again, thank you very much, Eugen. Um, I know that you're just starting off your day. I know that a lot of us will be kind of heading to dinner uh, as the sun's kind of going out down now here. <laughs> um, but thank you everyone thank for joining you so us. Much. Yeah. Uh, Look forward to meeting you guys in a few more days uh, on the next session. Yep. So see everyone Thursday and uh, have a good evening or, or rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.